There is only one thing a writer can write about. What is in front of his senses at the moment of writing. I am a recording instrument. I do not presume to impose story, plot, continuity. Insofar as I succeed in direct recording of certain areas of psychic process, I may have limited function. That was a recording of the late William S. Burroughs, the author of Naked Lunch. The novel and the controversy that surrounds the novel is what I'll be exploring in this presentation. Naked Lunch was the last novel to be surpassed legally for its obscene content in the United States. In 1966, the novel won its censorship trial and subsequently paved the way for free literary discourse. In this presentation, I will argue that Burroughs wanted to shock audiences and this obscene and often shocking language was purposeful and that despite being high when he wrote the novel, he's completely self-aware and his reasons for doing so. I will soon explore the content and the reaction to Burroughs' novel, but first I would like to quickly introduce the author and his influences. Burroughs was born on the 5th of February 1914 into a wealthy family in Missouri. He attended Harvard University, where he studied English and anthropology. After being turned down in an attempt to join the army in World War II, he picked up a drug addiction, something that impacted him not only for the entirety of his life, but also impacted his work. The affluence he gained from being born into such a wealthy family was cast aside when he was confronted with the realities of underground life in America. A member of the queer community, Burroughs slept with many men during his marriage to his wife, someone that he actually later killed. Her death was surrounded by a lot of mystery as he continually changed his account on what happened. He was eventually convicted of manslaughter and served a two-year suspended sentence. I think it's definitely worth noting that Burroughs sleeping with men during this time was an act punishable by law. In Naked Lunch, he often refers to members of the gay community as the F-slur or as queers. There were no positive connotations associated with terms for gay people during this time, so queer was definitely intended to be used as a slur. However, I think that this is definitely a self-identified slur. He's placing himself as a queer and taking ownership of the term. Therefore, I feel I cannot criticise his use of the language when I later talk about obscenity. Burroughs was most notably a key figure in the Beat Generation, or as it's otherwise known, the Beat Movement. Described by Britannica as an American social and literary movement originating in the 1950s and centred in the bohemian artist communities of San Francisco's North Beach, LA's Venice West and New York City's Greenwich Village. Drawing on inspiration from jazz musicians, the Beat Generation advocated for personal release, purification and illumination through a heightened sensory awareness that might be induced by drugs, jazz, sex or the disciplines of Zen Buddhism. They found the futility of modern society sufficient justification for both withdrawal and protest. This idea of heightened sensory awareness, in particular awareness induced by drugs, is something that William Burroughs definitely aimed for when writing Naked Lunch. Released in 1959, this was a book created in a time when authors were really invested in writing about the subconscious and what thoughts and ideas could be reached whilst high. It is likely for this reason that Burroughs wrote Naked Lunch whilst high on drugs. Burroughs being on drugs whilst writing the novel is evident not just from the content but the structure of the book, which goes completely against typical plot structures. The plot, if you choose to even describe it as such, is not linear. Burroughs was wanting to write to display his own conscious so that other writers or readers could see what was possible. He wanted it to be that the reader could start the book from any chapter and the novel would still accomplish what he intended. One could argue that Naked Lunch is a memoir-style novel. It certainly draws on Burroughs' own experiences of addiction, something that he frequently spoke about during his lifetime, even once in recovery. Uh, the damage to health from, uh, from addiction is minimal. But it has done things to your soul. <laughs> What happens to your perception of reality? It's always to be remembered that, uh, that uh, junk or any kind of uh, opiate is a painkiller, and therefore it will uh, lessen your perception of reality. What happens to your ability to cope with day-to-day -day crises? Nothing. Nothing whatever. Matt, so far as, crea as creative work goes, I say very definitely can't be indicated. And I would never have uh, been able to write uh, Naked Lunch, for example, unless I'd been off heroin. Burroughs drawing on his own experiences and writing whilst high would explain the lack of linear structure within the novel that I've just mentioned. Instead of a clear plot, the reader is presented with three locations that Lee, the protagonist of the novel, moves between. In my opinion, the most of seen of these being the interzone, the realm in which Lee enters once high from heroin. This interzone is located within Lee's subconscious and presents the reader with the most graphic ideas of torture, gay sex, drugs and violence found within the book. 
This brings me nicely on to exploring the idea of obscene language and the content of Burroughs' novel and why it was banned upon its release. When speaking about the trial of Naked Lunch, Michael Barrow Goodman said that the court trials and other actions against Naked Lunch provide a moral benchmark. We cannot fail to recognise, in retrospect, the speed in which we assimilate into the mainstream of American life, that which was once unspeakable. I wish to make note of and explore this term unspeakable. Frederick Whiting suggests the word unspeakable means what is forbidden to say, and that Goodman's words can be taken as representative of the reception framework within which Naked Lunch and its trial has been understood. As I suggested earlier, once the trial of Naked Lunch was finished, there was room for an exploration of new and free literary discourse. The unspeakable had become speakable. But what was so unspeakable within Naked Lunch? During the post-war era in which Naked Lunch was written, there were great anxieties about sexual pathology, language and authorship. As Whiting notes, these were issues that were more than just a matter of free speech. They were matters of monstrosity. Desires and addictions, whether they be for drugs, sex, violence, behaviours and their agents, were all taken as instances of monstrosity. Naked Lunch encompasses all that was suggested to be monstrous. I will include a few quotations on the screen now. I want to explore this one from the early stages of the novel in chapter four as an example of this idea of monstrosity. Here, Burroughs has placed the narrator of the novel with Dr. Benway, who he describes as an expert on all phases of interrogation, brainwashing and control. The following passage is in reference to a reconditioning center, something that Burroughs is likely comparing to rehabilitation centers in America. While in general, I avoid the use of torture, torture locates the opponent and mobilizes resistance. The threat of torture is useful to induce in the subject the appropriate feeling of helplessness and gratitude to the interrogator for withholding it. And torture can be employed to advantage as a penalty when the subject is far enough along with treatment to accept punishment as deserved. To this end, I devised several forms of disciplinary procedure. One was known as the switchboard. Electric drills that can be turned on at any time are clamped against the subject's teeth and he is instructed to operate an arbitrary switchboard to put certain connections in certain sockets in response to bells and lights. Every time he makes a mistake, the drills are turned on for 20 seconds. The signals are gradually sped up beyond his reaction time. Half an hour on the switchboard and the subject breaks down like an overloaded thinking machine. I think that there is no denying that the idea of torture, especially in this context, can easily be argued as monstrous. The graphic descriptions and the language used throughout the novel when speaking about torture, however, is why it was deemed monstrous and therefore censored. It is literally described as the most shocking novel in the English language on the back of my copy of the book. Yet the reason for Burroughs' use of this language is not monstrous at all. Yes, he definitely wanted to shock his readers and grab their attention. But here he's actually been critical of the human desire to take pleasure in witnessing the suffering of others. He is certainly not celebrating it. The passage I've just read takes place in a fictional place called Freeland. In my opinion, a land likely based on America, the so-called land of the free. The government in Freeland has no obligation to care for and protect its residents or those visiting. Burroughs is critical of the government's minimising of the crisis that is taking place with addiction and general disorder, emphasising that they are far more involved with the image that they are presenting rather than the safety and well-being of their citizens. The passage above is suggested that the government is blaming those in the reconditioning centres for this crisis and that they need to undergo disciplinary procedures. Burroughs is using this arguably monstrous language and depictions to suggest that actually this is completely counterproductive and that the government needs to admit their faults. It would be worth noting that this book was written at the start of the rise of the opioid epidemic in America, something that I personally feel Burroughs may have been referencing here. Gerald Miller, in his work Understanding William S. Burroughs, says this, Burroughs focuses on a form of power that he terms control, a ubiquitous force that infiltrates even the most mundane aspects of quotidian life. It constantly changes form to adapt to changes in subject life and global relations. This seems fitting in reference to the passage I've just discussed, as I read this section of the novel as a direct insult to the changing tactics of the American government and pharmaceutical industries, who blame the addicts rather than looking at how and why the addiction has started in the first place, and the control that they have over the addictions that are apparent in many people's everyday lives. I think it's definitely worth exploring reactions to the novel at the time of its release and also the publication process before I go into detail about the trial. Miller states that Burroughs represents a crucial figure for understanding the various waves of postmodernism that began occurring in the 1950s because of his literature, his philosophy and his life have continued to inspire generation after generation of writers, artists, musicians and philosophers. Therefore, his writings and the persona he cultivated prove essential to understanding contemporary American fiction as well as genres beyond that. Looking at responses to Make It Lunch would allow insight into how he's inspired new artists, but also why he was censored and where the negative reactions to his work stem from. I referenced power such as political earlier as a form of control, but I certainly think that the language in Naked Lunch acts as a system of control and influence also. 
I actually found it rather difficult to find many articles in online archives from the late 50s and early 60s that spoke about Naked Lunch, even in a critical way. I think that it's extremely telling of the fact it was a novel that many wish to not spread information about. Megan Wilson's study into the reception of Naked Lunch is a great place to start, though. The varying reactions to the novel are evident from her opening sentences. Reception of William S. Burroughs' Naked Lunch has run the gamut. It's been hailed as a work of genius, a masterpiece of experimental fiction, to famed as a piece of filth, an exercise in pornography, and regarded as a book of yawns, a composition without merit. Burroughs knew that his book would be deemed obscene straight away by American authorities, and he refused to allow drastic revisions to his novel. Instead, he made a deal with Olympia to publish his book. In a letter, Burroughs writes, I'm sure the deal I made with Olympia was the best deal I could have made. I saw Jack fucking around five years with American publishers. Of course, the two pornographic sections, Hassan's Rumpus Room and AJ's Annual Party, are in and very important parts of the whole structure. This was a unique opportunity. Selling to a US publisher is now going to be easier. All I have to do is jerk out two chapters which are right together. In short, I can prepare the MS for American or English markets in five minutes. Olympia published his novel advertising it as a forbidden masterpiece. In turn, Naked Lunch was in high demand because of its forbidden status. Those that read Naked Lunch were categorised, like Burroughs, as suspected smugglers and outlaws. This was because Naked Lunch was viewed as socially unsanctioned. It was also, due to its obscene content, literal contraband in the US at the time. When studying Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer in recent weeks, I did think that Naked Lunch bore some resemblance. Personally, I find Naked Lunch a much more successful novel, and despite the language actually being more shocking, I do not feel as uncomfortable reading it. In fact, I really enjoyed Naked Lunch as a text. Rossett, who published Naked Lunch in the US, also published Tropic of Cancer. It was the publication of Tropic of Cancer that pushed back the American debut of Naked Lunch up until 1962. Rossett had his back up against the wall defending Tropic of Cancer in lawsuits all over the United States. Upon its release, Naked Lunch was banned in Boston for its obscene content. In 1966, the Massachusetts Supreme Court reversed the decision due to testimonies by Norman Mailer and Allen Ginsberg. They argued that even if this writing contained pornographic material, it was still art and contained redeeming qualities. The main argument being its dealings with drug addiction. And many literary journals at the time discussed such topics. Therefore, it could no longer be banned. As if even a tiny section of the novel was considered of redeeming value, then it was not able to be banned. I will place a link in the handout I've produced to the full transcript of the trial, as it's definitely something worth looking at in detail. However, I'll pop up a few quotations on the screen here. I really find Ginsberg's poem um, in reaction to Naked Lunch very interesting, in particular the idea that the novel presents reality and the idea that the obscenity is natural. The method must be purest meat and no symbolic dressing. Actual visions and actual prisons are seen then and now. Prisons and visions presented with rare descriptions corresponding exactly to those of Alcatraz and Rose. A naked lunch is natural to us. We eat reality sandwiches, but allegories are so much lessest. Don't hide the madness. I also want to quickly read out this quote from Grazia in his closing statement at the trial. So I think it's of great importance in understanding why Burroughs wrote Naked Lunch and its impact on society and education. Your Honour, we were taught this long ago, that is the sentiment expressed by Mr Burroughs, which I have adapted in my concluding argument. A long time ago, the artists and writers had contributions to make to civilization's knowledge and learning, as great, perhaps, as our scientists do. As mentioned, the novel's ban was lifted, but I want to finalise by discussing what the censorship of Naked Lunch means for us now. I certainly think that because Naked Lunch still has the capacity to disturb us and be described as obscene, even by today's standards, that as readers of literature, we haven't necessarily adjusted to how ignorant we are to the underground of our so-called enlightened and aware world. I believe that the trial and the censorship of the novel raise many questions that are still applicable today. Firstly, who has the right to determine whether a text does or does not have any social value? Secondly, in reference to topics like monstrous thought, action and sexual interest, do most people not have a capacity for thought like this, regardless of whether they're acted upon or not? Finally, why should one give the court the power to decide whether or not reading a text is in our best interest or not? Surely we should be allowed to consume whatever forms of knowledge or art we desire. Burroughs wanted this novel to be packaged as controversial on purpose. He wanted to challenge these questions I've just laid out. Yes, it could be argued that because of its highly publicised subversive status, that the book may be overshadowed by its notoriety. But I think it's up to the reader to dismantle the language within the book in order to achieve any sense of freedom in a thought process or action.